All right, Raf Jello here from RT Sport and welcome along as we delve into Irish motorsport for the next hour or so with a trio of young drivers who've been making their mark on the international scene. One of those is Kildare's own James Rowe, who I've interviewed a couple of times on this channel. 2023 saw him earn his first podium at Indy Next Level and he'll be back for more with the Andretti team next year as he looks to propel his chances of getting into the IndyCar series. I was speaking to him yesterday and you'll hear that interview later in this video, but... Right now, I'm joined by Offaly's Alex Dunn and County Down's William Creighton. Both have had strong 2023s, with William becoming the first Irishman since the late great Craig Breen did it in 2011 to be crowned Junior World Rally Champion. Alex, meanwhile, is coming off the back of shining during the prestigious Macau Grand Prix weekend and topping the timesheets at Imola in an F3 test just before that. And I suppose before we get into your 2023s now, because, um, you know, you've had exciting years, as I said in the intro there, you know, um, the I think the one thing that unites you as well, you come from um, families that do have kind of, uh, you know, the kind of racing in the blood and in the genes. And I suppose, uh, William, yourself first, um, understand when you were like you were doing the circuit uh, of Ireland rally back in 2016 that uh, you're, you know, you're sharing the track with your dad or it, he was he was in and around and involved as well. Yeah, I, I suppose I well, I grew up on a farm, so I think, you know, a lot of kids grow up on a farm, whether it be a tractor or a quad. You know, you you quickly start driving something. So that's that's where I started driving quads and uh, race quads for a bit. Um, I had an old uh, scrap car that my dad brought home from work one day. Um, it was going to the the, the scrapyard, and instead it came back to, to our house, and that was that was my first car to drive about the yard. And then yeah, just got into uh, karting, and and after that, then headed into to rally cars so yeah it um 2016 I, I don't think i actually got a start um in the circuit because we couldn't get an entry and then um but yeah my, my dad competed in a lotus cortina so he's uh rallied for quite a few years and gets a lot of fun out of it and um yeah i think he gets a lot of fun now following me and uh, i've taken up the the family budget for rallying over the last few years so um yeah, he. Uh, I suppose he was the one that got me into it, um, and uh, yeah, I've got him to thank. Yeah, and Alex, for for you as well. I was chatting to your dad very briefly um, yesterday evening, and I know um, for and uh, he would be, of course, Noel Dunn, and people who were involved in Formula Ford back in the nineties would probably know him as a as a champion at the time. So I guess um, he would have been a big influence on you as well, kind of starting off. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think my my story is definitely somewhat similar to Williams. Um, you know, like my like you said, my dad used to be a racing driver. So I think at the round of age four or five, um, I would I would always go to the tracks with him, whether that be abroad or at home. Um, in, in Mondello, I used to always go to the tracks with him, and he'd take me in the car. And I remember being in the Formula Ford, and he'd sit me on his lap, and he'd take me around for a lap with him in the car. So I've always been around it from a really young age. Um, and then he kind of introduced me to karting and gave me the opportunity to try and kind of start my own thing in racing, and then it it kind of evolved from there. Yeah, and I suppose William, for you as well, you eventually went down the rallying route, but like similar to Alex, um, it was karting to start off with. Yeah, I did, did quite a few years in karts and did a year in the Super One, um, the, you know, the British Kart Championship, and that I suppose was the first time that I'd really, you know, stepped into to serious competition, um, and yeah, opened my eyes to you know to what all that had in store and. I think I learned a lot from that, you know, just general, you know, racecraft skills. And, you know, you always can carry that up through whatever motorsport discipline you, you do. So, yeah, karting was where was where I um, started. Yeah. And uh, even going back, um, I suppose the with the, the route you're down, obviously, it's uh, it's not single seater. So there's the relationship there with your co-driver as well. And uh, Liam Regan has been, you know, someone you've worked with now for, you know, for a very, very long time. And, you know, in terms of what makes a good pairing in terms of yourself and your co-driver um, over that length of time, what what are the factors that, uh, that play a part? Yeah, it's been a long relationship. Liam and I started in Junior 1000, um, Junior Allen for 14 to 17 year olds, and he's still with me. So I think actually Greece, I was looking at stats, I think it was like our 97th rally together. So it's quite crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, first of all, you know, you have to get on with your co-driver, especially whenever you're um, spending so much time with them. So, you know, we've got a good relationship there, which which is great. Um, and then, you know, obviously, importantly, he's he's very good at what he does uh, inside the car and outside. He's he's very well prepared and 
does a lot of work before the events. Um, so much you can do now with um, you know, with information online before the rallies. So yeah, I mean he's he's just he's very good at what he does. We have a good relationship and and he's puts a lot of effort into it. And um yeah, uh hopefully he'll stay with me for for a few more rallies yet. Yeah, and uh, Alex, I mean, your career has kind of taken you further afield at a very, very young age, having to, you know, first go over to the UK to race and then onto the continent as well. And in terms of deciding what championships to go into and uh, at what stage to do that, like how, how, like how did you kind of forge that career path then in, in those early years? Um, you know, I think the original plan my dad and I had was, you know, my dad's always been the type of person that if you're going to do something, you may as well do it properly. Um, and I think when we got the idea that I was kind of pretty decent at what I was doing, um, you know, and when I got the idea that I really wanted to try and go all the way, we said that okay, if we're if we're going to do this, we may as well do it properly and and race in the in the best championships at the time. Um, so we really it was a struggle, but we worked hard to try and get the the budget together and to race whatever it was we decided to race at the time. Um, so I think I did a year and a little bit in in karting at home. And then immediately we went straight to racing the British Championships, which in car in the the type of car that I was in at that time, um, that was where the highest level was. Um, and then we went to race in Europe, um, and I did a couple of years there, and then we started car racing. So our kind of trajectory the whole way through has been try a race, try a race against the best drivers possible in the in the best championship possible, um, and then in, in that way, then I can I can improve the best I can. Yeah, and you've obviously made a, a brilliant go at that so far, um, you know, and still at a at a very young age, um, at eighteen. But in terms of balancing that with school as well, because you know you're you're going far afield. I know listening to interviews from the likes of Lando Norris, etc., on their kind of routes up, you know, they sometimes they would have tutors with them. How did you balance it with you know the I suppose the challenge of that age of having like junior certs and then thinking about leaving certs? Yeah, well, um, my my main focus has always been racing. Um, I guess kind of the, the the school path has never really, I would say, benefited me in the in the route that I've taken. Um, so I did my my first year of secondary school, um, and then we decided to come home to do homeschooling. Um, so I kind of I do it when I can, um, but you know I've had a little bit more breaks here and there because I've been away so much. Um, for example, last year I was racing for six weeks nonstop in the UAE, and then six weeks nonstop between British F4 and Italian F4, and this year it's been a bit more calm, but still, um, you know, I think we've, we've put a lot of focus into racing. So that's kind of our, our, our main focus at the moment. But yeah. we try to fit it in. Yeah. And William, I know similarly as well, I'm reading back some kind of old interviews from around the time you're starting out. I think just before you did your A-levels and I think you were, um, am I right in saying you were studying uh, maths, business and physics, which I think in a way kind of does suit the career path you're, you're on at the moment in terms of the, the subjects. Um, were you looking at it sort of as a, as a fallback or was it a sort of thing that you were looking at actually that all these things are going to be helpful for the path I'm going on now? I think I, I picked you know, those, you know, I picked to study that probably because I enjoyed them. And, you know, I think that goes hand in hand with obviously enjoying motorsport, you know, those, you know, topics, you know, are very relatable to, to what we do. So, um, yeah, I think it was just, it was a natural choice and, and the right choice, but yeah, obviously, um, I think I did a bit more schooling than, than Alex by the sides of it, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I think the main focus was always, um, you know, get the week at school done and then let's go racing or, or rallying, whatever it was. Uh, and I was, I was lucky to have that opportunity. So, um, yeah, it, uh, and I also did, you know, I did a business studies there. So, um, we've got a family business back home and, and whenever I'm not, uh, rallying, you know, I'm, I'm able to work there and help out there, but, um, depending on what way you look at it, it's, I've been quite lucky that there hasn't been too much work this year that it's been mostly, mostly rallying. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's how that happened. Yeah, am I right? That's the the retail forecourt and the petrol station, and even at a young age, you're there, um, kind of as a teenager, kind of working and making a little bit of money on the side there. Yeah, I suppose doing doing my bit at home that can then justify going uh, away quite a lot of weekends to to race, and we've also we've got a a recovery business and, and small workshop on the side of that as well, and I guess that's you know the you know the earlier years where I was more attracted to with um you know, the mechanic side and, and, and the cars, um, just trying to drive really any opportunity that I could. So, yeah. Yeah. And then Alex, I suppose for yourself, um, the step up then from karting and then into single seaters, uh, what is that step up like in terms of the, the challenge and uh, jumping from one to the other? 
Um, yeah, you know, I think uh, with the exception of racecraft, I pretty much had to relearn everything I learned from karting. Um, you know, the technique, everything, you know, understanding weight transfer is, is something you learn in a car and the braking is a lot different. Um, you know, you can adjust stuff like brake bias, which you learn, uh, you have gears, obviously, which is a big thing. So with the exception of learning how to race against the car, you pretty much have to relearn everything. Um, but I think one thing that helped my step a lot was simulators. Um, you know, I have a sim at home, which I use pretty much as much as I possibly can when I'm at home. Um, and I use that all the time before I go away racing. So I think having an understanding of how a car worked before I had ever driven one was already kind of there in my brain. I already had a pretty good idea of, of what to expect. I just kind of needed to learn the, the natural things. So I think it, it was a big jump, but, but thankfully to the Sims, it, it wasn't too bad. Yeah, and investing in the Sim probably tells you like just the amount of dedication that you have and uh, on this path that you're on. So was it always kind of in the back of your mind, like Formula One, you know, this is the goal and this is what I really want to get to? Yeah, you know, I think pretty much from the beginning of my karting career to now, the goal has always been Formula One. Um, I think when I kind of got a, a good idea of the path and when I got a little bit more into racing and, and more into F1 as well, you know, I realized, okay, this is kind of where I want to end up. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, the goal since I've started has to be in Formula One and, and to be a Formula One world champion and, and the goal is still the same. Yeah, and uh, obviously your pathway last year in terms of the British F4 Championship, you know, it was immense, like through the the 27 races and across the, you know, the 10 circuits that you're on and many recognisable names, the likes of Brands Hatch, Silverstone, Donington, great tracks with great amount of history and you rack up, I think it's 11 wins, 11 poles, poles on them. Uh, can you just talk me through that season and just uh, like, I suppose, how elating it is, you know, to, to A, win that championship, but also, I suppose, some of the challenges that come with it as well. Yeah, you know, I think that was probably a season where I think if I got that again, I'd be pretty lucky. That's um, an incredible year. Um, you know, I think to break the record of most wins in a season, with the likes of, I think, Piastri was in the championship previous to me, Norris was in the championship. Um, I think Russell was in it at one point as well, maybe. So there's been a lot of a lot of good drivers through British Chef 4. Um, so to break the record of, of a championship like that and, and win it with a round to go as well. Um, obviously, I wasn't able to race the last round in Brands because I was at Italian F4 in Monza. So to win the championship in a completely different championship at another track, um, yeah, you know, to, to dominate something like that was was pretty special. Yeah, and then this year, I mean, for you, William, I mean, you you know, you made your own little bit of history as well by joining a very select group of. Um, great drivers when you look through the list of drivers that have done it to become junior world rally champion and uh, you know when you came into the year was that the kind of the ultimate target and did you kind of feel from this from the off that it was an attainable um, achievement it was definitely it was definitely the target we'd done the championship twice before uh, once before in, in the same car so it was you know um, it was really probably our last shot at this championship to to try and win it um it would have been difficult to try and put another year together and i suppose there was quite a lot of pressure and you know having that aim but going into the first round never having even won an event uh, in the previous year so um it was the aim but you know there was a lot to prove uh, to sort of make that feel real um and thankfully we were able to start the year in sweden with a win um as close as it was uh, it was still a win and you know that I think that gave us the confidence that we needed um, just to then kick on and, and realise that, you know, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, because overall, as a, am I right in saying, 34 stages you win across across the entire season. And aside from Sweden as well, then and the third round as well, you go to Italy and, uh, you know, you, you win that uh, you win that round as well. Can you just talk me through some of the, you know, I suppose the ups and downs and across, the, I suppose, those two rounds in particular, because, you know, to you put yourself on the list in terms of being a round winner is, uh, you know, it's a great achievement in, in and of itself as well. I think generally it's been a really strong year for us. You know, we led every event that we went to this year at some point, um, and we won two of them. So, and we've got a lot of stage wins. So, you know, in terms of pace, it's been a really good year. Um, of course, we had our ups and downs. I mean, starting in Sweden, we we led the event, had quite a strong lead, and then we had some issues. And and long story short, the bonnet came up during one of the event, one of the stages. We had to stop. Liam effectively had to stand on it, get it back down, and and go on then to win that event by I think it was 0.6 of a, a second so um, yeah after I don't know how many stages 300 kilometers um, to win by 0.6 of a second it, it makes it really sweet uh, 
Yeah, and then another win in Sardinia, um, another really tough event. Um, we had a couple of punctures and, and sort of stuck to a game plan that was different to one that you might have at a a faster rally, um, just trying to preserve the car and, and think smart and, and, it, and it worked for us. We got a win there. Um, yeah, and then and Estonia was, I suppose, another enjoy, uh, event that I really enjoyed. Um you know, we led the event there. It was probably one of the quickest rounds of the championship, um, apart from Sweden. And and then unfortunately we had a bit of a mistake and, and had to retire. And um I think one good thing with the junior world championship is that even if you retire, you can come back in and if you win a stage, you get a, a point towards your championship. Um so you know, that's it's something that you can still fight for if you've had problems, you know, at the start of the event. So uh, we had to you know, use that mindset twice, I think, this year. And, you know, it, it helped us win the championship. Yeah, because uh, Greece and the Rally Acropolis, I mean, you are you're you go into it with the with the championship lead, but uh, it ends up being quite nail-biting because of issues out of your control with the coolant and overheating. And, um, you know, you have Lauren Pellier and uh, Diego Dominguez kind of breathing down your neck as well. Uh, you know, when the, when the issue with the car kind of started cropping up, you know, was there a point in your mind where you thought, oh, I'm, you know, this uh, this might be slipping out of my grasp, or were you kind of based off of some of the the ways you had overcome previous issues in previous rounds that you kind of felt, you know, I still have a chance here. I think rallying is a tough sport, so you know you quickly got to learn how to deal with these sort of problems. I suppose all motorsport is, but yeah, it was just it was really difficult. You know, we had we had cool, we had we had end, we had problems with really a pipe coming off the radiator, and you know we started to get alarms and um we were pretty close to the end of the stage. So it's very difficult to know what to do. And you don't want to do um, damage to the car that can't be fixed and, and put you out of the event altogether. So yeah, we, we got to the end of the stage. We had to push the car and, and drive it as little as possible to get to the next tire zone where the mechanics could look at it. But unfortunately we had to retire. Um, M Sport Poland did an unbelievable job then to fix the car after and, with a mixture of other guys having problems of their own in, in the remaining two days of the rally and us winning enough stages, we were able to win the event. So, you know, to go from such a, a low at the start of the rally um, to then try and gather yourself back up and work for the rest of the event to, to come out as winners, it was, yeah, I thought Sweden could never be replicated and how that all panned out. And then whenever what happened in Greece, it, it was quite unbelievable, but um yeah a rally that felt like it went on for two weeks um and yeah just unbelievable to get the result that we did in, in the way that we did yeah and then obviously you know when we see homecomings at dublin airport usually you know it's olympians and the like coming back or you know a, a successful rugby team and then you get that opportunity and liam as well uh to come back and get a nice welcome and on top of it then when you look at the the list of people who have won the junior world rally champion in whatever guys that has been in previously the likes of uh sebastian loeb sebastian Ogier, and obviously we'll talk about craig green very shortly as well it must feel amazing yeah, just, you know, to celebrate with everyone coming back home. And I mean, there's been so many events over the last couple of months that, you know, I've been recognized for winning and, and Liam and, you know, that's really nice. I suppose I never really, you know, you don't think of those things. It's just about, you know, enjoying what we do and trying to, to win. Um, and I suppose the furthest that I would thought about was celebrating at the end of the last stage. I never thought about, you know, all the things whenever I got back home and, and what doors it might open for the future. It, um, you know that's all come now in the last month or two and as you say the list of names that have done this before me it's you know it's an honor to be to be added to that list now yeah and obviously it was a as i mentioned craig green there it was a year pinch with sadness for irish motorsport irish sport and just i suppose the the country as a whole as well with um his death at the pre-event test in in croatia back in april and uh, i know the uh, junior wrc would have had a round there as well in in croatia um at, at the same time and but i mean for you and i uh, we might talk about how you maybe how well you would have known him but that the sense of devastation must have been immense as well i mean given a you know him and b just what he meant to, to people in rallying and then just Irish motorsport as a whole as well. Yeah, I mean, for Irish motorsport as a whole, it's been extremely difficult. You know, there's been a number of fatalities in, in rallying drivers and co-drivers this year. So, you know, it, it's so difficult um, for everybody and particularly, you know, their loved ones. But I suppose Craig, you know, um, yeah, it was very, still is very surreal. Um, 
you know, the I think it was the Thursday before we headed off to Croatia. He was at a a junior rallying open day and and I was also there and he's given kids advice. He's given me advice. And, you know, you say goodbye to head off to the event and and then news comes through of what happened. So it's it's very surreal. Um, you know, and, and so difficult for his family and his friends and you know, particularly this time of the year, it, it's going to be very difficult for them all. So um, I suppose an, a positive point is that, you know, we now have the, the Craig Brain Foundation, which was announced uh, last week. So, you know, not that we needed that to keep Craig's memory alive, but, um, you know, that will definitely do that. And um, I think it epitomizes him. You know, he was there that day giving kids advice and, and helping them out. And he was already supporting the next generation coming through. And, you know, it's it's nice to have this in place now that that can definitely continue. Yeah. And um, do you remember when you first met him? Um, obviously, you were following kind of a similar pathway and in a way also winning the junior WRC like he did in 2011. You know, it's a it's a it's a path. It's a, it's the same path, essentially. But do you remember when you first um, would have crossed paths with him? I think the first time that, that we properly met was maybe um, at a Hyundai test that I got an invite to for winning the uh the junior brc um and he was the the official driver at the time for developing the rally two car and he was able to you know show liam and i about give us a, a spin in the car and then the test was eventually actually called off because the the snow was that bad um but yeah it you know long before meeting craig you know we knew a lot about him what he had achieved and you know i think the main thing that everyone knows knew Craig for was his personality and whenever you whenever he got to the end of a stage in the WRC you never really knew what he was going to say but you knew that it would be truthful and his emotions would be uh would be on camera so yeah he's uh, just probably one of the most special characters that was ever in the WRC um and an Irish rally yeah and Alex I suppose for yourself uh just as a you know a young um up-and-coming driver and I guess in terms of having, you know, those figures within Irish motorsport that are, you know, have already forged a path, was Craig somebody you might have um, looked at as, a, you know, kind of an inspiration among other um, Irish drivers? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's always great to see um, a fellow Irishman, you know, competing at such a high level and, you know, really, really doing well and then kind of putting Irish people on the map. Um, you know, obviously I'm not, I wasn't involved in rallying myself, but I always saw him, you know, whether I, we went to the, the Irish Awards or whether I was away racing, you know, I, I think a couple of times when I was younger, um, he used to he used to drive carts um, for, for fitness and, and I was always there driving as well. So, you know, I, I remember meeting him and, and every time he saw me, he'd always come over and say hello and, and have a chat with me. So, you know, whenever we crossed, we, whenever we crossed paths, he was always super nice to talk to. Um, and, and yeah, you know, definitely to, to see somebody like that um, so well known and, and so high up in the sport um, disappear and is you know it's heartbreaking yeah and uh, certainly all our thoughts with his, with his family and uh, the motorsport community here as well as a whole and we're going to just uh, uh, play an interview here with uh, James Rowe as I said earlier um, he's uh, he's going into his third Indy next season his second full season he's going to be with the Andretti team and he's going to uh, he was chatting to me yesterday about what's on the cards for 2024 and also his dreams in terms of uh, that target of getting to the IndyCar series in 2025 alright earlier this year I was speaking to James Rowe Jr. ahead of his first year with Andretti Andretti in Indy Next and fast forward to the eve of a new year and after 2023 which featured his first Indy Next podium he'll be back for more with Andretti to tackle his third year in the final rung on the ladder towards the ultimate goal that is the IndyCar series and James I know you're uh, you're a busy man but join us from the States how are you? Good good Raph thank you for having me um, happy to be here always love chatting with you so glad to make the time. Yeah and what uh, which coast are you on at the moment and like I suppose, uh, West what coast. Point, yeah West Coast here in San Francisco. Um, the past few days had some partner events. The last few days and uh, meeting today um, here and uh, yeah, fly back to the West or the East Coast tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning, nice five a.m. flight. So that'll be nice to wake up to. Yeah, no. I suppose before we um before we talk about your plans for twenty twenty four and you know of course uh, as I said in the intro there your plans are confirmed in terms of what you'll be doing in twenty twenty four in the Indy Next series. Um, going back to the start of this year, I mean you were coming off the back of a what was sort of a partial season yeah. in what was then called uh, Indy Lights with the TJ Speed Motorsport. Now you didn't do the full calendar that time. I think it was eleven races. Then you you took as we spoke at 
the start of this year, you moved on to Andretti and exciting opportunity. Um, you know, when you when you reflect back in hindsight now uh, and you look back at 2022, even if it was a partial season, how helpful was that in terms of being a launch pad for the season just gone? Yeah, I think it it, it helped in areas. It didn't it didn't you know change again completely because this year in Indy next we had a new tire, so the whole dynamics of the car and the way in which we run it and the setup and the driving style changed astronomically. We went from Cooper tires and Indy lights to Firestone tires and in Indy next. So um, the series actually tra- changed quite a lot. Uh, the qualifying format changed quite a lot. We went from having thirty minute qualifying sessions and two sets of tires available to having an eight minute qualifying session and one set of tires. So really the whole dynamic of the series changed as a whole. Uh, yes, it was great to have experience on some of the tracks and, um, you know, being used to the car and traffic and the aero wash and all that goes with that was was obviously very useful. Um, but having said that, there still this year was a massive amount to learn for everyone across the board because it was such a new format, new tire and, uh, of course, new team. They, they run things quite differently. Yeah, and as you said, new team. It's a much bigger organization as well to what you you were in before the previous year. Like, uh, what are the I suppose the pros in terms of moving into an organization of that size in terms of the Andretti the Andretti brand and all that comes with it? Yeah, the bottom line is it's just the amount of resources that we have at our disposal. You know, is is phenomenal. Um, every single person on my team, the team, as I told you prior, is split into it's a four car team, split into individual teams within all of us. They all work together, but each car has their own full time crew. So having that at my disposal, then all the resources that go with running with Andretti and access to technical directors and IndyCar engineers to bounce ideas off. And then, of course, just the Andretti brand name, you know, it's known by 75 percent U.S. households here. So being identified as one of their four drivers in 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 Indy Next is was a dream come true for me and and quite big here in the US as you can imagine. Um, so basically on track, you know, huge resource uh, advantage, off track, um, massive brand advantage, and the two together just meet in the middle, and it's it's a synonymous force. Yeah, and uh, as you came into that, uh, the first race weekend. So this was in Saint Petersburg, uh, in Florida. It wasn't, you know, your season ended up being quite, you know, a really good season as it as it went on. Um, a difficult start though in that first weekend. Yeah, that was a difficult start indeed. Um, we came off the back of two days testing in in Homestead in Miami. Um, with the new tire, the only two days that we had, Homestead's known for massive tire dag. Um, so we thought this tire just was a you know a two or three lap tire. So tuned to it then came to St. Pete a week later and it was drastically different um and really I got caught out there and this is where it's going to be you know obviously a different ball game this this coming year is the eight minute qualifying session really got me out in St. Pete if I recall um was 21 cars around um you know a 65 second lap so the gaps to the car in front is is very very minimal um that's something I wasn't used to so we actually had a car there that was that was on for much better. You know, we we ended up with very very quick cars. It's one of the things that Andretti is very good at showing their resources. Is if you roll off not so great, give them a night, and you come back and you're in a different rocket ship the next morning. They just they get to the bottom of things very quickly because they have so much data built up over the years. So we had a very very quick car, but didn't qualify well just purely in traffic for those whole eight minutes. And that was the first time we had an eight minute session, and I was just gone by. Um, so I was glad that was the first one to get the really, you know, slap in the wrist that, hey, you got to figure this out because this is how it's going to be all year. And then in the race, we worked away forward six or seven spots and we're moving forward. And then we had a mechanical, a boost pipe went in the car and a DNF. So not an ideal start by any means for everyone, but, you know, you win and lose together as a team. And and it really didn't bother us. I mean, of course, it's not what we wanted, but the the key to St. Pete is getting through it. You know, you're not going to win the championship or win the season in, in that first weekend. So look, it put it on a deficit at, you know, we were zero points going into round two and other guys, you know, had scored many points. So that makes it difficult, but um, nonetheless, uh, we got through it and it didn't, uh, didn't hinder us too much after that. Yeah. Cause pretty much a few weeks later on, then round two, you're in Alabama and you end up getting a, a fifth place, like a really strong finish as well. I was just, what I was just reminding myself of the highlights there um, over the weekend. And I think there was a nice uh, switcheroo you did on uh, Daniel Frost as well at one point. Although, yeah, did you have to give the, you have to give the place back, I think. Yeah. I got done for blocking. <laughs> I, that was, we disagreed with that one. Um, 
but yeah, it, it's look, it, it, American racing is quite different. You know, the whole fade and blocking rule is is obviously controversial, and depending on what side of the rule you're on, you're you're either happy with it or you're not happy with it. Um, so yeah, that we I got an undercut on my turn five, and and then was supposedly blocked into into eight. Um, but yeah, that was a great race again. We'd had very very strong race cars all year. Um, and every race we just went for. I think the biggest mover all year um in the field uh which is obviously something that that is is good in some aspects but also not so good in other aspects because we shouldn't have to move <laughs> as forward as much as we did at times but anyway that's uh that's the nature of the beast yeah because i think uh in the build-up to that unfortunately it, it, it april um was the was the month that uh craig green died of course yeah. uh our, you know one of the great Irish drivers of recent times in the World Rally Championship and someone you knew you, you knew a little bit yourself and I think in the build you had gone back for the funeral at that point as well and um, before the before the Alabama round yeah yeah so I, I went back the week before that and uh look I, I, Craig is just synonymous with Irish motorsport he did so much for the island of Ireland and Irish motorsport put us on the map in WRC for many many years and I knew Craig through Team Ireland, which I was fortunate to be part of the John Campion's Foundation that he founded in 2017, and Craig was involved in it. And then I was a CJJ funded driver, as was Craig. So we knew through, through it. But really, the day that set me, you know, like in stone with Craig and really had me looking up to him was in 20, uh, 27, early 2017. I was training at the Team Ireland training facility in Mon. It was DBSM, was what it was called at the time. And he came in with one of his good friends called Patrick Croak, who um, is in a wheelchair and has been for many, many years. But DBSM had a um, zero gravity treadmill that lifts people up and you can walk. So that day I witnessed one of Craig's best friends walk for the very first time in his life. And that was something that Craig instilled and made happen. Um, he didn't have to do that. He took his friend there, drove him up, got him on this treadmill that he knew about from the Team Ireland program. And Patrick walked for the first time ever, from from what I understand. Um, and just to see that that was in his heart, and that meant so much to him. And he went out of his way in the middle of a WRC campaign to do that for a friend. Uh, you know, that just clicked me. So this guy's a genuine, genuine guy. You know, he, he he's nothing but good in him. So obviously, then when he passed, um, it was quite a quite a shock, really. You know, I think he was was really sucked about it was he was only getting started it was probably one of his best seasons in wrc and he was really getting momentum and was super super quick and this is outlook on life in general we as athletes we all know what the pressure is like at times in the sport and decisions that are made off the track or off the rally stages and his outlook around it is i think there's a famous interview somewhere where he says just enjoy it. you gotta enjoy it man or something like that um so yeah went to pay my respects and that's something that i felt i had to do because um there's not many like him yeah, and I and I noticed as well after the after your performance in Alabama as well. I think one of your quotes was you did dedicate the race to him as well. Yeah, we we carry the his name um on on the car for that weekend. And again, that's just something that you know he would have done if it was any other Irish driver. He's that kind of guy. So uh, yeah, you know it's 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 a it's a it's a terrible loss, and uh, his family will always be uh, in everyone's thoughts. Yeah, and just in terms of the Irish motorsports com- community as well, because just from like the a kind of documentary I was involved in a few years ago and just you know other interviews and things I've done um it is a very close-knit sport highlighted by what we were just talking about there but it is it is hugely tight and I always get the impression everybody sort of knows each other yeah well it, it's a small island you know it you know five million people on the island of Ireland it, it's one racetrack one racing community you know it's it's very very small at the end of the day and yeah you're right the Irish community is very tight-knit you know we mightn't speak to each other every day um because we're all in different regions of the world doing different things and different championships and different series and it takes so much mental capacity to do your own program but one thing for sure is that if you're ever called upon or someone asks for advice or needs a steer the irish community is always there for one another so it's um yeah it's great you know and we seem to have a nice diverse portfolio if you will you have someone in india and such as myself you have alex dunn you know and the f three-sided things you're charlie eastwood on the sports car side obviously josh mclarain and william creighton on the on the rally side so there's a there's a really diverse group there that's on different continents and different series which is obviously exciting 
Yeah. And off the back of Alabama as well, Sparks, you know, you had a really solid run of uh, points finishes all within the within the top 10. And then it kind of culminates with another uh, fifth at Road America. And uh, and this is obviously a track in Wisconsin, I believe, like when you were in uh, Formula Three Americas, it was one of those tracks where you actually you won there, I think, and you kind of hit the yeah, ground. Well, it, it's funny when I first moved to America at 18 years of age. I came to America, never been here prior, even on vacation or holiday. And I moved, came over with my two bags right after I finished leaving certain. The very first town I lived in was Elkar Lake, Wisconsin, because the team in which I was competing with that year called Arms of Motorsport in F2000 was based out of Elkar Lake. So I arrived there in February, freezing cold, Wisconsin, dairy capital of North America, full of farms and fields. I said, Jesus, is this, is this America? You know, it's not what I thought it was. <laughs> um, so I lived there for six months. And ever since then, Elkhart Lake in theory is my first home in, in North America. So love that track. I had just been repaved. So it was very, very quick. Um, and again, yeah, we just had a, had a mega race, mega, mega pace throughout and uh, worked our way, um, worked our way forward. So yeah, we, you're right. We did then go on a, on a mega run. After yeah. That. Yeah. And at that point, you know, as, as, you know, I think I outlined in the intro, a podium finish did come um, eventually. But at that point, did you feel that was sort of slowly coming on the cards? Yeah, well, I was kind of getting frustrated on myself. And it was one of the, the learning things from, from this past year. You know, from that point onwards, there were the midpoint of the season. We went on a run rung of three events, if not four, certainly three, where we didn't qualify any lower than the second row to grid. But yet, I only came away with one podium. So, um you don't have to be a mathematician to work out that that's not a great conversion rate. So, um, you know, for me to take away from this past season is, is, is it's such a qualifying series. Those times that I do qualify up front on the first two rows of the grid, I have to execute and be on the podium at a minimum. So to only come away with one podium on that streak is, is obviously not, not ideal, but you live and learn and you, you, we understand why we didn't achieve that. So that's the most important thing right now. Um, so next year, the goal will be to, just keep qualifying up there, but now uh, convert them into wins and, and podiums. And is that down to sort of tire deck or um, what What are the, you know, when you're looking at it as a, as a learning um, curve, what are you looking at as kind of factors to, to home in on? Various different things. Um, you know, on the oval in, in Iowa, I didn't make a great decision at the start. I went low and got freight trained around the outside and was down low for two or three laps on the bumps and, adjust my bars in the cockpit to adjust the balance to go low on cold tires with low pressures and heavy fuel and the car was bottoming out and all these things start adding up whereas now you, know, you won't see me at the bottom of Iowa again on a race start I can tell you that if I go high I'll get up high um so there's a number of little things like that that just you only learn through experience you know um and it's another thing when you start up front you know you have a decision do I go low or do I go high Whereas when you're starting further back, sometimes you don't have the decision. So you're just forced high because that's just where, where it is. Um, so there's times and, and scenarios this year where just once I did it once and learned once, it's banked and you won't see me making that mistake again. So very different things. Um, more so on the race craft side. And yes, then a little bit of dag and, and one or two errors here and there. Um or maybe a little strategy on push to pass wasn't so wise at times. So um no, we we uh I can't be telling you everything I learned. So we got it all noted. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And uh, of course I think um when we'd spoken um almost a couple of years ago, I think one thing that um I think you outlined yourself and that was noticeable to your results is when there are street circuits and street races, you tend to you, you tend to come to the fore and be able to stay out of trouble. And that was uh, very handy around uh, the Music City Grand Prix in yeah. Nashville where you get fourth and it's a messy weekend. Weather conditions are all over the shop. And then as well as that, you have uh, multiple safety cars as well to kind of get through. Yeah, yeah no, that was a, a weekend where we rolled off. It was a wet practice session. We were P1 throughout the whole practice session initially. It started drying, went to slicks again. We're P1. Um, and the car, since we ro we rolled off in Nashville and Andretti has impressively strong street course package. Um, as is doing IndyCar and Indy Next, I just really understand it. So um the car was an absolute beast. I could do whatever I wanted with it all weekend, I could arrive at any angle to a corner and not be worried about it. And that just as a driver inspires so much confidence. Um but then, unfortunately, in practice two, we had a mechanical, didn't run practice two. It was then ultimately rained off. And then we went to uh, compete in 
qualifying and that was postponed due to the weather which was unfortunate because we had so much pace throughout um and then we went racing and worked our way forward and uh yeah that was um that was that was a fun weekend actually i remember after the race all four corners were white walled on the tires so we took the right the the, the riding on the outside of the tires was just removed completely and that's how the margins we were working in over the course of that that weekend so um yeah no it was good yeah, in terms of like um reflexes and things, as you, as you say there, you know the you know your margin between yourself and on a wall or a barrier during a you know a street race, it you know it's a very it's a very they're, we're talking about really small margins here, one little error you can you end up uh, in the wall. Like in terms of like training, in terms of working on reflexes and things, do you have any little um little things that you do like pre race or um you know between events? Yeah, so it's it's a it's a big area of what we work at away from the track and pit fits motorsport pacific gym i train out in indianapolis which i may have mentioned to you before and within it there's many many different areas that are all driver pacific and we have a a a cognitive and reaction room within that facility in which is part of our program every day so um that certainly pays off when you get to the street courses and uh i think it's just more so a perception also respect for the street courses as well you know you got to respect them otherwise they will bite so it's it's just a generic overall standing and feel for where the limits are and building up to the weekend as the grip levels come up you know as more and more rubber goes down those limits get stretched and uh when it comes to qualifying it's time to lay it out there yeah and then of course uh nashville may have been you know a very encouraging result and really good but five days later then you go even even better in uh, in indianapolis and you get your first podium finish second in the race and we might talk about how close you came to actually winning it as well because of you know the margin if there were another if there was another lap or two i think that would yeah. have been a nailed on win but um it, it again you've talked about quality already and this performance was also built on a really good quality and starting um starting second as well yeah yeah no that was that was great um we again another area where we did we rolled out in practice weren't so strong just gave my comments and feedback and my engineer he's just he's the man he said all right leave it with me i got it he literally we were second last in practice and i said hey you know this car is not not what i want to drive i can tell you that and told him what i needed out of it and he goes all right don't worry about it we'll be fine we'll be good and I kind of looked at him. I'll never forget it. It was one of those moments that's going to sick me forever in the pit lane in IMS. I just said, yeah, we're going to be good. We're, we'll be right there. And I kind of looked at him like, how does he know we're going? I don't know where he's getting this confidence from. Went back to the truck, did our quick debrief. Said, yeah, don't worry about it. I'm going to do this, this, and this. Rolled out. And I remember on the out laps, this thing is quick. It just, it did everything I wanted. Um, on the first push lap and yeah, qualified, qualified second. Um, and went into the race then. and. We had more downforce in the car than the others around us. So I knew Foster was just going to be in my draft the whole time. So really just let him go um, to chase down McElroy and sat in there. And I didn't use any push to pass for the middle stint of the race at all. Just just drove around and we, we were matching leaders pace without push to pass whilst they were burning down their push to pass. And that's an extra 50 horsepower every time you engage it. So the guys behind me and the guys in front of me were using it. And we just sat there and and then there was a bit of dag around Indy and managed that. And then, yeah, as, as the race started coming to me about 10 or 12 to go, I started using what I'd left and yeah, we got within four tenths of a second of winning the race. Um, still wake up at night about what I probably could have done a little different to, to win it. in that day, um, I didn't get a great run off the last corner onto the main straight when I had a, a go at, at McElroy and that, you know, cost me about a, a car length, which would have been the difference again alongside him or not. Um, and anyway another lap or two we would have had it but it is it is what it is i think at the end we we're like second lap quicker than anyone on the track so um that was just a major statement and yeah we brought home andretti's first one two of the season first qualifying one two on the front row um so michael andretti and jf torman are both very very happy men that uh that evening so yeah of course would have liked to win it um that's what we're here to do but nonetheless we we showed an extreme pace yeah, and obviously in racing, um, in most uh, most series, most categories, of course, wins, podiums, pole positions, and fastest laps, they generally tend to be the metrics that uh, get measured on. So even on a personal level, you know, as you said, the team are delighted, but on a personal level, to have that one podium um ticked off must have been just uh, must have been amazing. 
Yeah, it was it was great. I mean, it was more so to get my first podium with Andretti Autos, first front row and first podium with Andretti Autosport in Indianapolis, the home of U.S. Motorsport, the racing capital of the world, the team's base out of Indianapolis. There was just so many little things that felt great. You know, it was just it was really um, really good. And yeah, and we had a party on the following night at Michael's house that I knew was coming down the road. So uh, it felt good going to his, going to his house party, having given him a one two. Yeah, and as the season went on, then you you finished seventh in the in the championship overall. And you know, as you know, do you, does it does the finishing position to you does it actually matter? Um, if it's not first, or do you look at it, or do you use that sort of as a you know something to base how you build on for next season? Yeah, I think both really. You know, you like it depends what mood I'm in, <laughs> which way I look at it. Um, but ultimately, no building blocks is is always what it's about, and look at the year and look at where we left so many easy points on the table and if that hadn't been the case where we would have where we would have finished um so the goal is always to win and win the championship and that's what i'm going for next year uh and yeah i think if we just implement what we learned this year and and refine a few areas and, and hone in one or two areas where there was a consistent loss we'll uh we should be in the fight yeah, and uh, as uh, I mentioned at the beginning, you've signed up for another year uh, with Andretti, so your second full season at Indy Next Level, third um, third year overall and in involvement in it. But um, I guess you must look at it as a positive, just how early that decision was announced and how early you signed yeah. up as well and the strength of that, that relationship between yourself and the team. Yeah, well, it actually stemmed back to last June or July, would you believe, you know, when you talk about that that run we're on, the president, J.F. Torman, just said, hey, you know, I got I woke up to an email one morning and I was saying hey, we want to get you locked in for next year. You know, what's what's let's chat. Um we sat down, went through different things. So yeah, no, that that's that's awesome. It's always great to get those things set in stone and it's it's an honor to see that they have that, you know, belief and uh, instillment in me that they wanted to wrap it up so early, so it wasn't a question. Um so yeah, we're we're happy with it. You know, it's it's a great arena to be in. The goal is obviously IndyCar in twenty twenty five. So um couldn't be with better people to make that happen. Yeah, we might talk about that 2025 goal and the, I mean, I suppose the ultimate dream of getting into IndyCar just a little bit later on. But um, you had the test day then in October. So this is the uh, the Chris Griffin Memorial Test in Indianapolis. Yeah. Um, in terms of, is it, is it, in terms of times, is it representative or do you kind of, do you focus much on that or is it more just about overall development? And, you know, no, that, that, that day, uh, of course, times always important, don't get me wrong, but that day, we rolled out with a brand new car, fully rebuilt from the ground up. Morning was rained off. And in the afternoon, it turned into a half day's test. Well, actually, two hour test. Um, so we just shook our car down, went through install checks. Everything was brand new. Um, I went through the motions. Uh, didn't read into it much at all. Um, it was, I think it was 50 degrees there on that day and when we race there in, in May it's going to be about 85 and track temp nearly near 100 so the days aren't even comparable we were, it was a shakedown day for us we did want it to be a test day our plan was to shake down in the morning and then go running in the afternoon but as I said it got rained off so turned to a shakedown day and then we went to Barber Motorsports Park in Alabama two weeks or sorry three weeks ago now and had a very strong test there. Um, we're really, really happy with that and worked on a lot of things that were in that review process from this past season and um, tried a few things that we didn't necessarily get a chance to try during the season. And uh, we found some uh, some time. So, yeah, we're, we're cautiously very confident after that test with, with what we found. Yeah, and as you said, 2025, the goal is to get into the IndyCar series. Um, For that to happen, what needs to happen for you in 2024 just to almost um, put yourself in the best position possible for that? Yeah, perform. Bottom line, go perform next year. Be up front all year. Fight for wins, podiums, um, show pace, show show all of the above. You know, and off track, ensure partners are getting their value and return on investment, which is a big focus of, of ours here in, in, internally and, and just be winning on and off the racetrack. And then what will be will be, you know, I just want to get there in 2025 and say, you know what, I couldn't put one more ounce into that. And um, yeah, you know, the goal is to be the first Irish man uh, on the grid of the Indy 500 in over four decades. So that's what we're shooting for. And um, I'm sure we'll we'll, we'll be there. 
Yeah, and uh, you won't be the only Irish driver as well, I understand, for 2024 in um, Indy Next as well. Jonathan Brown as well, secured a drive. Right. Yeah, do you know right, him well? Yeah. Uh, not... Do I know him? Not, not. Wouldn't call it well. Um, he drove for turn three. I used to drive for turn three. Um, see him around the track and, and different things like that. So yeah, no, it's cool to have another Irish guy over. Um, and um, yeah, it's just great to see the Irish platform, you know, expanding. Yeah, and um, obviously as we're coming towards the end of the year, um, I know you're coming home. I think for just before Christmas, and then I imagine it's pretty much. As early January, you're straight back. Um, to to get yeah. ready for twenty twenty four. Straight. Uh, Straight back early January to um well yeah land land the week before Christmas some partner stuff in Europe and then a week at at home will be nice and then early New Year straight back we test early January in Sebring Florida um and different things going on in the meantime so yeah no rest for the wicked they call it an off season but I don't know who came up with that name. <laughs> Yeah, no rest for the wicked indeed. I think we're we're all in that sort of boat. But look, all I can say to you is Merry Christmas and uh, best luck for uh, next year as well. And look, we'll be back in touch once you have your first race win. Um, we'll be we'll be chatting Thank again. You very yeah, Thank you very much. Let's try and that sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks very much. Great, thanks, Raf. So that is James Rowe speaking to me yesterday just about uh, his uh, upcoming Indy next season and also the season just gone where he made plenty of progress, including a podium finish as well. And I suppose before we um, we talk uh, about 2024 and what your title means later on, William, um, there are tangible benefits for next year, I suppose, um, in terms of you know winning a, a junior WRC and then what the funding means in terms of being able to participate in um, some of the rounds of the WRC2 next season. Yeah, from, from winning the championship this year, we get four drives uh, with M Sport Ford in WRC2. Um, and on top of that, we've got 200 cars from Pirelli to use in the WRC2, which would um, would be enough for a full season, and a full season is seven rounds. So that's what we're we're guaranteed, the four events. Um, and that's that's an amazing prize. Um, and, you know, I've been with M Sport Poland now for... All my years in the junior WRC, so you know to have four events with with M Sport again in the next category, it's it's nice to continue that relationship. And you know, of course, we're going to want more than just four events. Um, and and you need to do more than that if you're if you're serious about progressing in the WRC. So, yeah, we've been working on trying to put a program in place now over the winter, and uh, there's still a lot of work to do, but we're very much focused on on doing that. Um, so. Yeah, I I guess I've been I've been very lucky to do three years in in the WRC. Um, we started the journey with the Motorsport Ireland Rally Academy in twenty twenty one, and they've been behind me ever since. And you know, hopefully, we can continue that relationship um with a lot of other supporters and and try and put something together now for next year. Yeah, and Alex, for you, you know, come, as we come closer to twenty twenty four, like you've a huge amount of momentum behind you, and we'll kind of break it down because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Macau, um, as well, you know, um, even just watching watching the highlights of your your performance in the quali race was just exciting to see. Um, but your um, you know, the GB three championship this year seemed to go really really well for you. You know, best rookie finished second in the championship, and uh, just I suppose how happy are you with how that how the past year um has gone. Um, realistically, I probably wouldn't say I was extremely happy. Um, you know, obviously I, I really wanted to win. Um, I think, yeah, you know, being, being a rookie and still to come away with P2 is definitely a, a strong result and, and something I can be, be happy about. And there's a lot of positives to take. Um, but, but ultimately I'd say there's definitely a few points in the year where, you know, I think things out of our control didn't really go, um, as we would have liked them to have gone. Um, and, you know, I think after the first round, we were quite far away from the championship lead. Um, and then by round three, I think I was almost leading the championship again. So I think with, with how the championship has gone as a whole, I think if you told me I was going to be in, in with a chance of winning it come the very last race of the season, I probably wouldn't have believed it, to be honest, um, because I think during the year it was, there was quite a few difficult moments. Um, I think it was quite, quite up and down. Sometimes we struggled a little bit, and then other times we kind of dominated the weekend. So, yeah, you know, like I said, there's a lot of positives to take, um, definitely more positives than negatives. Um, and, and the result was still pretty strong. So ultimately, I would have liked to have won, but, but I'm still happy with, with how it went. 
Yeah, and then the F3 test uh, in Imola then in October as well. I think it served notice to your abilities to, you know, plenty of people. I mean, finishing top of the timesheets. And um, can you just tell me about that particular, um, you know, that particular day as well? Because I know the conditions were were far from far from ideal, but you kind of had to power through that. And then, um, you know, post, uh, post what was an excellent time. Yeah, you know, I think I found out that I was doing that F3 test Um pretty much during the last run of PB3. Um, and then I went straight from Donington to Imola. So yeah, you know, it was definitely the, my most enjoyable day in a, in a racing car ever. Um, you know, I think to get the opportunity to, to, to drive an F3, um, let alone race one in Macau, I think to drive it in, in the first place in Imola was something really special, something I've, I've dreamed of for, for a very long time. Um, so to get that opportunity, I was extremely happy. Um, and yeah, you know, the car is quite a big jump, to be honest, from, from GB3. Um, I think physically wise, it's quite a jump, um, especially with the braking. You no, know, I think um, braking wise, it's pretty much as hard as your leg can physically allow you to hit the pedal, um, which was something I've never experienced before. Um, but yeah, you know, it was, it was a really good day. The trick, I think, as something to experience in a test, I think I probably got the best of both worlds. You know, it was dry, it was wet, it was mixed conditions. Um, I think that's not something that you'd get for your first rookie test, which was nice to experience. Um, and then, yeah, you know, to be quickest at the end of the day in, in tricky conditions was pretty cool. And did you get a sense of the reaction back home? Because I know there was a lot of, you know, there was a, you know, there's a lot of excitement here. And I know, you know, you're you're further afield. Maybe you won't see everything, whether it's on social media or, or anything. But obviously when someone from Ireland does really well, it does resonate here. So did you catch much of it? Yeah, you know, I, I do keep up to date. Um, you know, I always look at all my social media stuff to see what's going on. Um, but yeah, you know, I think it was kind of what would the I think the minute everybody found out I was doing a three test, my phone kind of blew up, um, which was something pretty cool. Um, same with Macau. I think when I announced Macau, I think my phone went pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, you know, to have that support from from Irish people at home to see that there's so many people supporting me and and, and watching me race and, and wanting me to 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 achieve my dreams is, is something that's it's super nice to see yeah and you mentioned macau um obviously which was last month and um you know it's one of those iconic uh iconic street circuits and uh, of course you, when you look at some of the the names in f1 particularly some of the drivers in the 90s a lot of them that was kind of some uh something they they all you know pass through there and um, some of them putting in you know outstanding performances and um, can you just tell me a little bit about the I suppose the track and that sense of anticipation taking it because you know for me even kind of having it in my mind's eye you know the kind of yellow and black barriers the such little space on track as well um, you know what in terms of the reality and your I suppose your expectation going in like how to uh, how to tally up um, to be honest I had no expectations um, you know I found out I, I got the call up to the race a week and a half before the race. Um, and I thought, okay, this is probably going to be pretty tough. Um, you know, I think there was F2 drivers on the grid, Formula E drivers on the grid, um, a lot of F1 Academy juniors on the grid. Um, and I think it's probably one of the hardest junior single seater championships in the world at one of the hardest tracks in the world. So I think if I expected going into the race that I was going to do really well, um, I think it probably would have been quite tough. So I kind of just took it as it come. Um, you know, ar arriving to the track, it's quite it's quite an intimidating place. And um, being there for your first time, you know, I think the the day, the morning of each race and and the night of each race, you know, you see all the cars, you know, the taxis and the buses driving around the track. And and I arrived in a taxi and we, and we got to drive around the track and and see it all, which which was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, you know, definitely my my most enjoyable experience in my racing career to date. Um. I think the the weekend as a whole, I'm probably still a little bit sore. Um. After after race two. Um, but no, to be honest, I don't think I could be much happier with how it went. Um, I think to have never raced an F3 car before and to have only driven a car once before, um, I think to come away with second in quali and, and second in the quali race is something that I don't think any rookie has, has ever done. Um, and, you know, being from Ireland as well, I think there's not a lot of drivers at that level from, from where we're from. So to do that and, and achieve it um, on, on a world stage is super cool. Yeah, and then the quality race itself, where you, as you said, you qualified really well. You were sixth, and then um by uh, by Lisboa, which is uh, I think is a turn three. Um, at that stage, you've uh, you know, I was kind of I was just rewatching the highlights there, and uh, your little move on um, you know, Dino Vaganovic into that corner, and then you know he's you know he's there, kind of breathing down your neck, and you're kind of holding him off. Can you just talk me through that that early part because it uh, you know. <laughs> You know, it's a you know, it was a it was a brilliant start. You know, to to race up from sixth and nearly take second. 
Yeah, you know, I think uh, I got reps. Um, I was already, I think, uh, fourth or fifth by by turn two. Um, I got a really good start, and then I managed to outbreak Dino you know, around the outside into into turn three. Um, so to go from sixth to third in in three corners, two of those being not really a corner, um, I think was an incredible start. I kind of when I came out of when I came out of turn three, I kind of took a deep breath and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm in a podium position here. So I think. I kind of just tried to to manage the race the best I could. Obviously, um, tire degradation F three is a, a really big thing. Um, I think they're kind of made like that on purpose to make the racing a bit more enjoyable for the spectators. So, trying to manage the tire deck through a race was quite tough. Um, I didn't really know what to expect in that situation because obviously I, I've never raced it before, so I haven't experienced it. But I just really tried to kind of look after my tires and, and manage it the best I could. Um, and then we had the safety car, which made things a little bit easier managing it. Um, and then, yeah, the safety car restart was was pretty much perfect. Um, I got into second um, coming out of turn three. And from then on, it was kind of just managing it the best I could and, and holding position. Yeah, because I think uh, I was listening to your, um, you know, the 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 interview after the uh, the quality race, and um, I think you had said you suspected that there would be a safety car at some point. So there's a lot of you know strategy that you have to kind of go through before the before the start of the race. Yeah, you know, I think if if the race went the whole distance the whole time, I think everybody probably would have been full push because the the race distance was quite short. So um, you didn't need to do a whole lot of tire saving, but I kind of had a good idea that there was going to be somewhat um, at some point a safety car. So I really managed quite a lot in the first three laps, um, knowing that eventually there was going to be a safety car and we wouldn't have to push anymore. So I managed it as best I could. Um, and then eventually, yeah, I was I was right in the end, luckily, and the safety car came out. Um, so, yeah, the, the tires were in good shape after the safety car restart. I got a, a really good start, um, and then I just kind of managed it in second from there to the end of the race. Yeah, and for the main race as well, I mean, um, I was just kind of re-watching it there as well, and I think just kind of going into Lisboa again, you were looking for the inside line, weren't you? But in the end, just with, uh, you know, the traffic there, you kind of, you were forced uh, forced wider than you would have um, would have liked, I guess. Yeah, you know, to be honest, I think it was maybe inexperience. Um, you know, I, I think it was quite simple. I don't think I got enough heat into the tyres. Um, you know, we had quite a long break on the grid before we started the race compared to race one. Um, so I just don't think I got enough heat into the tyres. And then I, I tried to overtake for, for P2 going into turn three. And we drove into quite a lot of dust before the braking zone. So I think that naturally as well didn't help. Um, and then as soon as I pressed the brake, the grip wasn't there. And, and I locked up and I went straight. So... Yeah, you know, my, my own mistake, um, but, you know, I think definitely now knowing how, how, how vital it is to, to kind of get a heat into the tires compared to what I've raced before, um, you know, it definitely won't happen again. Yeah, and, you know, taking the weekend as a whole, regardless of how uh, it ended in the main race, do you feel like it's going to open doors for you? Because I think people did take notice of that, you know, how you did in the quali race and in qualification itself, and then not even mentioning, you know, the F3 test before that and, uh, you know, the your performances across the last couple of years. Yeah, you know, I, I'd like to say it would open doors. Um, you know, I think to, to do that well um, on a world stage against some of the best drivers in the world, um, at one of the hardest tracks in the world while being a rookie. Um, with my little experience of the car, I think that's probably something that's unheard of um, or at least something that I haven't seen in a very long time. Um, so I think to be able to do something like that and, and achieve something like that hopefully will, will help us out in the long run. Um, you know, my, my family and I are, are working really hard to, to try and achieve our goals. Um, obviously, we're, we're quite limited as a family with budget. Um, so I think that's kind of the main thing depending on, on what we can and can't race. Uh, but hopefully hopefully it will open some doors and, and help us out yeah and william as we um as you detailed earlier in terms of having the you know the fully fund four fully funded drives and the wrc2 next season like looking through the calendar it's a it's a more extensive calendar of course than in the junior wrc and would if you do the full uh the full you know every single round it takes you to some further reaches around the globe but um for you then to make that step up in terms of trying to get to the you know the world rally championship itself what um what needs to happen for you this coming year for um for you to i suppose to kind of boost that um that opportunity i think firstly this year you know we need to be smart if we're going to do um you know to even do a full championship in the wrc2 is is a massive ask and I say that's what we're working hard, like what we would like to do. But um, you know, if you do that, you need to be smart in the the events that you choose to do. Obviously, we'll 
return to the rallies that we've already done and got experience off and, and where we feel comfortable. Um, but there's also going to be events that we're not going to have done and we need to go f- there for the first time, which is always difficult in rallying, trying to make pace notes on a two pass recce and then, you know, doing that at 50 or 60 kilometers an hour and then trying to drive flat out in the rally car is, is quite challenging. Um, but yeah, if we can if we can do that, um, and and think about it as a, a multi year program to get experience of those events and you know work our way up through the WRC two championship, then you know ultimately the aim is to get to the top of the sport and and get a seat in in you know a top manufacturer's car, um, in WRC one. So, you know, um, that still remains the goal, uh, and we just gotta you know try and figure out the best pathway to make that possible. Yeah, because of course, I think as as Alex said there, you know, the funding is a huge thing, and I've talked to James Rowe and others about this as well. It's a uh, you know, in the I suppose in the area that you're in, um, it's something that you can't really you can't really avoid. But if you're looking at it overall for those coming up behind you, with what whether it's in rallying or car, you know karting or you know going into single seaters eventually, in terms of you know helping Irish drivers, what would you like to see? Um, um, you know that maybe would level the playing field with some of our either some of our neighbours or, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, for from other parts of the world as well. Yeah, I mean, for sure, in, in motorsport, I think you know ultimately, you know, it it it's determined on on the budget that you can bring. Um, you know, but aside from that, you know, you have to be talented, you have to work hard, and there's a lot of other elements that go into the mix of being successful rather than than just the budget, but. Um, you know, I've been very lucky, as I said about earlier, that being in the Motorsport Ireland Rally Academy. Um, you know, we're working on all different elements, um, fitness, psychology, um, you know, all the things that are required to succeed, you know, at that level. And I'm essentially making sure that I as a driver am prepared whenever I get to each event to give myself the most um, you know, the most chance. But I, I think, you know, a program like that is now being recognized by all a- ASNs across the world and particularly in, in, in rallying. So, you know, I think, well, I'm sure that's that's going to give other um, ASNs something to think about. And, and you know, we're very lucky here in Ireland that we have a program like that to develop and, and you know, spot talent. So, um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of other countries are going to be looking at us and what we're doing. And I know they already are and, and we're being recognized for what we've achieved. Yeah, and I, I did notice as well the the motorsport Ireland president Aidan Harper. He was um he had a, a couple of comments about the possibility of a WRC round coming to Ireland at some stage. Now nothing nothing is confirmed. I think they're still in the stage of trying to you know secure funding for it, but it could be twenty twenty five. And I guess for yourself, um, you know, to have it, it the I suppose the benefits that it would have in terms of uh putting I suppose a glow on you know whether it's rallying or just motorsport as a whole in Ireland that that would be a huge opportunity if it were to happen. Yeah, I think, you know, the last time the WRC was in Ireland was 07 and 09. So I was much younger at that time. And uh, I suppose because it hasn't been here since then, you know, I never have really thought about it too much or what it would mean. But, you know, now that it's a possibility and it's something they're working at, I've thought about it a lot more and and seen, you know, local drivers competing at local rallies in, in the WRC and what it means to them. I can only think what it, what it would be like to compete and be a part of it. But you know we have the stages with some of the best stages in the world um even if i am biased uh you know and we have the organization that that can make the event happen uh so yeah fingers crossed that you know i know Eden harper and the whole team at most are working hard to make it you know possible and it would be unbelievable if it could and i think if if they could do it for one year then everyone would realize that you know it's uh it has to come back um so yeah uh fingers crossed Let, let's see what they can do yeah, and I suppose Alex. Um, I suppose a final point uh, for yourself in terms of twenty twenty four. Um, I know there's you haven't confirmed anything in terms of uh, you know what championship you'll be taking part in or anything, but um, I presume the aim would be um would be the FIA F three. But um, where are you at at the moment in terms of uh, you know what next year is going to look like? Um, we have no plans in place yet. Um, you know, to, to be honest, the whole way through my racing career, I think I've. At least in that year of what I've been racing, I've had no idea of what I'm going to be racing the next year. And, um, you know, it's always quite quite a last minute thing um, on what we decide on whether or not I'll be doing. You know, we're always trying to find the budget. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working until as, as late as possible until a few weeks before the race to, to decide what we're doing. Um, so, 
yeah, you know, there's no plans in place um, as of yet. We'll, we'll, we'll keep on working and, and we'll, we'll keep on chipping away at it to see what we can manage to do. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, no no plans in in place for 24 hours of yet. Yeah, but I presume the way, as you said, um, you know, Macau sort of last minute, um, the F3 mm-hmm. test last minute, but then you go in and you kind of, you know, blaze a trail that you whatever, whatever happens and regardless of how much time you have, that you'd be really confident of kind of hitting the ground running, whatever, whatever it ends up being. Yeah, you know, I think um, I think a good trait that I've developed through my career is adaptability. Um, you know, I think, like I said, it's always been last minute um, or we've always been limited um, through budget on, on how much we can test and how much I'm able to drive. So I think kind of a, a natural progression I had through karting was I just had to had to jump in and adapt as quick as possible. Um, you know, we didn't have as much testing um, as we would have liked, so I had to just learn things quicker and, and be thrown into the deep end. So I think as I kind of got older and, and matured a little bit more, that kind of that slowly got better and better. Um, and I think now I'm at the point where I, I seem to be able to, to jump into things and, and adapt to them pretty quickly, which is which is a good trait to have in my situation. Yeah, which is a which is an excellent trait and uh, look um i just have to say thanks to both of you for uh for coming on today and uh look uh congratulations on your uh you know that your past year obviously uh for yourself with the f3 test and uh you know the you know the quality the qualities in macau alex and then of course uh william i can see a load of trophies behind you there as well so the you know among them the junior wrc's and obviously you're going to the fia prize giving as well so you know congrats on everything and best of luck uh best of luck with the with the future and hope Hopefully, you know, we'll be, well, look, we'll be, we'll be following your endeavors uh, as you go on. But uh, Alex and William, cheers. Thank you very much.